Mars cares for the opportunity to present to the community today for those of you who are here physically and those of you who are able to see and hear us via the live stream. Welcome all of you all to this presentation and I pray a lot God that something that is said today will be helpful that we can do something with what you are about to receive and I may be receiving from you also inshallah that we can do more to try to help our children and that is our focus today is saving our children. So with that, I wanted to uh, give a teeny weeny bit of a background for those of you who may not know. I am an educator. I spend majority of my hour, waking hours working on better ways to make sure that our students, our children, and it doesn't matter where those children are, it doesn't matter what school they're attending or what city they live in, I consider all children our children. And when it's, it's time to educate our children, I see that as a priority. So I spend many of my waking hours working on trying to make sure that I do the best that I can and I help others to do the best that they can. I'm a product of this community. I started my educational experience actually as a student of the age of four within this Muslim community and majority of my education um, has been within this community. And I see that as a plus because when I'm out there in the world doing what I do, many ask, what's your background? Where did you come from? And I have to give credit back to the pioneers, those who struggled and did what they had to do to make sure we had the best possible education that we could have at the time. I have to give credit back to them for listening to the signs that Allah presented to them, paying attention to those signs, following those signs, and giving us the best that they could give us. And it's with that spirit that I present to you the presentation that I'm planning to present today. So I'm going to shift gears and move over to um, focus on this screen here. So I'll be using this computer. Give me a second, please. So as I mentioned, the title of this program is, of my presentation for this program is entitled Save, Saving Our Children. And in preparation for this, I actually focused in on a particular text that is reflective of our leader. This is a new production that's been put together titled Life, The Final Battlefield. And I'm going to be referencing this book a lot throughout the presentation. And if you don't have a copy, it's available at the Miles Cares table, at the WBM Publications table, at the, uh, right up front. Uh, for measly $13. And I say measly because it does not represent, that price does not represent the value of the message that's in this text. And you see that with Imam Muhammad's language with his teachings throughout uh, his lifetime and now, and inshallah in the future. So to begin with, in order for me to talk about our children, I want to start off by saying when I'm speaking about our children, I see life. I see life in the rarest of forms. I see life that reflects God's creation. As a parent, we can't control everything about our children. Even to the day of conception, our children are conceived when God says it's time for them to be conceived. In vitro fertilization and the other things that the fertility doctors are doing, they can't control life. So when life begins, it's God's control. He decides when we are born, when we start to grow, and he decides when our time is up. So life is something that is initiated by the creator. And I think that's something that we need to hold very, very dearly in our minds. That God started life. God put life in the present, in our place for us to deal with. And it is him who controls what those are within our lives. Now, in my definition here of life, I'm using a little bit of what Imam Wartha D. Muhammad presented in the text, The Final Battlefield. But I'm also using some of the lingo that you find in science. And again, my background includes education, but my primary role, the thing that pays my mortgage, is me teaching as a biology teacher. So that's, that's basically what I do to make a living. That's not what I do to fulfill my heart, but that's what I do to make a living. But I also fulfill my heart at the same time. So what are the concepts that we have in biology? It's a concept called 
biotic. Bio means life. So if something is biotic, it's a living structure. We also have a concept in biology called abiotic. A meaning not. So if I say abio, I'm saying something's not alive. Imam Walid Muhammad taught us that life itself reflects an interaction. And that interaction includes several key things. There's an interaction between the living and the non-living. This interaction includes the things that are, are alive, surviving, existing, being in place because of living and non-living things. How many of you have been inhaling today? You've been breathing, okay? You'd be blue if you weren't, okay? So that's good, that's very good. How many of you have been exhaling today? All right, hopefully it's everybody, because otherwise you're keeping poison inside your body. Exactly. Now that oxygen that you're taking in is not alive. The CO2 that you're kicking out is not alive. Yet you cannot exist without it. You have to have the oxygen, you have to have the CO2. So inside of our bodies there's this interaction. Now what does this interaction allow to happen? Number one, it allows life to take place, and how do we define life in more scientific terms? We say life includes cells. The smallest form of life is a cell. Larger organisms and life are made up of multiple cells working together. Without a functioning cell, some, whatever it is, is not alive. Life also includes things that are able to adapt and respond to what's going on around them. Imam Walid Muhammad once mentioned about a willow tree. And he talked about how that willow tree's branches are weeping, but the trunk that that willow tree is being held up by is not so flexible. But a palm tree, that palm tree will give, and it will give, and it will give. And sometimes in the storm, you'll see that palm tree bending over where the top leaves are actually kissing the ground. And it needs to do that in order for it to survive. Now, if I'm totally rigid, totally rigid, and I don't respond and react to the environment around me, I become like the dodo bird. Does anybody know the history of the dodo bird? Extinct. It's extinct. Why am I extinct as a dodo bird? The food source that I was eating died. And I didn't have the ability to eat anything else. I didn't like the way the rest of the stuff tasted. And so my rigidity on taste caused me to starve to death. And now I am no longer here. Sometimes in our culture we say you're acting like a dodo. <laughs> so this is partially because we're not making sound, rational decisions. And so the ability for us to think and reason, the ability for us to be able to respond to what's going on around us and not be so harsh and callous is part of what makes us alive. Continuing. I have to do some work. I'm responsible for doing some work. The creator gave me the ability to store and release energy so that I could do some work. Not so that I can do some work just for me, but that I can do some work to help and contribute. And how do I get the stuff that I use to store my energy? I inhale. That non-living stuff out there, I take that in. I ingest. I eat things. Mm -hmm. I'll eat some green stuff. That's not dollar bills. <laughs> Plant. I'll eat some white stuff, some orange stuff, and all the other wonderful things that our God has provided us with that provides us with nutrients. And so with those nutrients, I have... Hold on a second. So with those nutrients, I have the raw materials necessary for me to be able to store my energy. Now there's something that scientists figured out. Humans can't make energy. Humans can't destroy energy. We can transfer it back and forth, we can store it, we can release it, but we can't make it. And where's the origin of that energy? It goes back to the origin of creation. It goes back to God. But he gives us this abiotic, it's not even considered to be matter, it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a force. He gives us this untouchable force to use to do some work. And I'm emphasizing that four-letter word. 
He gives us this stuff to use to do some work. And when we stop working, we're no longer alive. I need you to think about that as I go through this presentation. I don't stay exactly the same as I am when I start to exist as a cell. I get bigger. I get more complex. When I first start out as a cell, I'm relying on stuff that's been stored up in me to allow me to survive. In order for me to continue to survive and eventually do that work, I need to specialize. I need to learn. I need to gain resources that I will be able to use to fulfill whatever my particular job is. And if I don't gain, if I don't take in, I don't use what's been given to me, then I'm not going to be a productive contributor to the environment where I live. What's a prime example of that? Cancer. Cancer reflects a cell in our body that doesn't mature. It doesn't mature. It exists inside of our body and it starts to act like all the other cells. Oh, hey, I need some food. So it starts to eat. Hey, I need some nutrients. You got to give this up. Blood, give me, give me. I need protein. I need other stuff. How are you contributing back? I ain't got time. I just eat, sleep, and party. Does that sound familiar? I just take and take and take and I'm not giving anything back. And what do I do when I mature? I don't mature completely. I mature to the point where I can divide and become two cells. And now you got two of us that's just taking and taking and taking. And then we divide and become four. And we take and we take and we take. And pretty soon, the blood supply, um, ma'am, <coughs> sir, you're anemic. There's pain because this collection of cells is engrossing nerves. And those nerves can no longer send the impulses, receive the impulses correctly because now they're surrounded by these cells that aren't doing anything constructive. I want you to look at this not from a cellular standpoint, but from a human being standpoint. Think about people, no one in this room, because you wouldn't be here if you were. Or people listening and watching the live stream. You wouldn't be watching if you were. But I'm sure we can reflect back on people that have a cancerous nature. And that's what happens when you don't mature and find a way to give back. I'm on my topic, saving our children. I'm still sticking to my topic. As a living organism, a cell, complex organisms such as a human being, we take in, we release out. We take in what's needed. We use it correctly according to the templates that's been established by the Creator, and then we release. And the stuff we release, it's not waste because it's used by something else to make the stuff that we need. So there's a cycle. The Moss Cares, when Sister Robin came up, she talked about the Green Initiative and the recycling efforts that were being done. Any human being that's not concerned about the cyclic nature of our communities is a cancer, is a thorn in the existence of all of creation. Because that's part of who we are. We are recyclers. Internally, our oxygen, comes from something that used the waste that we kicked out. The CO2 is, again, it's not waste for the plants and for the other autotrophs. As a cell or the complex organism that we call humans, there is a need to have the right environment. My husband and I, we talk a lot about the cocoon and how the cocoon provides a protective barrier, covering with all of the materials necessary for that organism to thrive in a protective environment while it gets ready to face the world. The womb of a mother, the coddling arms of that mother once that baby is born for humans, provides a protective place 
with all of the needed necessities that can come from within to allow that baby to mature so that it can face the realities of what the world presents. And if you look at nature, God does that with everything. An apple seed, the apple tree, the apple as it's growing, protecting the seeds until it can deal with the harshness of the, cult of the climate. So God gives, the Creator gives all living beings a protective environment that allows it to grow to its best optimal level. Now I can grow, but I can also grow as cancer. So the growth needs to be done in a certain way, in a nurturing and providing way. One of the key components of something being alive is the ability to reproduce. Now reproduce is not the same as dividing and splitting. Reproduce is to make another organism like yourself, listen to me very carefully, and this is where we as human beings have been messing up, to make another organism just like yourself that's viable. The definition of viable, to be able to mature to the point of being able to carry the species on. Let's look at what's going on with our children. I grow up, I have this misnomer. I'm not having a family. That's for you. I'm only gonna have one kid, one child. I'll let the rest of the people in the world populate. My figure is too important. I'm not giving up my money and I'm not committing to you as a spouse because that's too much. I need my independence. Or the other side of that, oh, you're going out with my, my friend, pow. Or you angered me. You stepped on my toes. You ran the same clothes I have, pow. And so we're either ending the lives of our youth too soon, physically, or we're warping their brains to the point that they don't see the value in carrying the species forward. And so what's coming up is a culture, a part of creation, that's not producing viable offspring. So our reproduction is diminishing. And if you stop any of these characteristics, you're not considered to be white. Are you listening to me? Yes, we if any of this stops, just one, then the organism is not alive. A virus. Some people, I think this is a quiz. If any of you are planning to be a student in my class, close, close your ears. <laughs> I'm about to give you the answer to a quiz. A virus is not considered to be a living cell because a virus cannot reproduce on its own. A virus needs to be inside of a living cell to reproduce. It uses its DNA and the DNA of another cell. It's very close to being a living cell, but it can't reproduce, not by itself. You might say, well, a human being can't, but a human being can reproduce with another human being. A virus can't reproduce with another virus. It needs to be inside of a different species. So here's something that's very close, does most of that, but not considered to be a living cell. So again, I'm repeating myself. Usually when I do that, that means it's important. <laughs> if we miss any of these, we're not alive. Now let's look at our children. Endangered is one step before extinction. It leads to extinction. The dodo bird, now extinct. At one point it was endangered. If something is not fitting in to the environment, to the culture, to the existence of whatever's happening at that time, our creator has built in a system that allows that thing to become extinct. Moves over to so something else that's more productive from moving its place. And in our scripture, do you remember that ayat? If you're not using what God's given you, he pulls it back and he gives it to someone else. I'm shaking in my boots. 
Because I don't want that to happen to me. I want to do what God wants me to do. I don't want to be on that other side where my gifts have been taken away. Where I'm getting my book in my left hand instead of my right. Because my time here is only for a limited time. But he tells us what he's going to do if things are not going right. He's merciful, but he's not stupid. He's God. When an organism's characteristics don't match what's going on, I said, talk to you about the dodo bird, that organism becomes extinct. It becomes extinct. And I said endangerment is right before that. What defines extinction? When your birth rate is less than your mortality rate. You're dying faster than you're being born. Have you been paying attention to the statistics? And how many people have been killed? And I'm not talking about a battlefield such as overseas. I'm talking about the battlefield that's happening right here and in other industrialized countries. We are losing more than are being born. Now, is the solution to give birth? Just have babies, 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 babies. No. If we don't have the optimal environment for them to grow up and become viable citizens, that's not the answer. So it's not just the fact that they're dying. And their deaths aren't accidental, by the way. God decides when we're born and when we leave. We make our transition. But is it a sign to us that we need to do something different? Because are we providing that perfect environment for them? I say we're not. And I see them every day. About 300 of them every day in my classrooms. So how do we deal with this? How do we protect our youth so that they are able to grow up and be the, 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 the contributors to the community that we live in. Well, Imam Wadhidi Muhammad, in the first chapter of the final battlefield, gave us several clues. Number one, he defined this concept called community dynamics. Now, let me talk about dynamics for a second, just that word. I think he did an excellent job with community. I'm not even gonna try to touch that one. But I wanna talk about dynamics. That's a science word, I'm comfortable with that. Dynamics reflect something that's constantly moving constantly changing, constantly improving. So when I say static, stop. When I say dynamic, flowing. So when we look at community dynamics, we're not talking about, oh yeah, it's a community, but what is the community doing? What is that community accomplishing? We have a building, and we have a, a this and a that on our agenda, and we carry out those steps. Is there any growth? Because growth is a part of being alive. Or are we doing the same thing we were doing 100 years ago? In the same way? Or can we say we have new initiatives? <clears throat> I'm not going to be pointing to any specific organization. But are we evolving? Are we changing? Are we keeping up with the time? Or are we just continuously doing the same thing day after day, month after month, Ramadan after Ramadan? What are we doing that reflects this change? Well, here's how Imam Muhammad explained how the change should be happening, again, in the final battlefield. Number one, he defined community dynamics as a merger between an interrelationship between key components of the community. And without these pieces being there, not in isolation, I'm the politician. I don't need to talk to the economist. I don't need to talk to the educator. I'm the politician. I just need to focus on, oh, I'm sorry, it's time for you to vote for me. Excuse me, what do you need? And that's when they step forward. No, we need you every day, 24 seven. Educator, we need you every day, 24 seven. Health professional, we need you every day, 24 seven. And don't let me leave out the artist. Let me tell you something about that brain of ours. There's a little tiny organism called a C. elegans. It's a worm. 
so tiny you can only see it with a microscope unless it's in large, large enough or large quantities. And I have students doing work with the C. elegans right now. Why do we use the C. elegans? The C. elegans is what they call a model organism. It has features, characteristics that are similar to humans, and we can do some bizarre stuff with them that we can't ethically do with a human being. And why would we want to do bizarre stuff? There are some diseases that we suffer, and the only way to get to the answers is to do those bizarre things. One of the diseases that affects humans drastically that C. elegans is being used to deal with is Parkinson's disease. That's neurological. We can't take the human brain and the human cells and do some of the stuff that we can do to the C. elegans because everybody's like, oh, we're going to lock you up. That's cruel. You shouldn't be doing that. But in order for us to, again, see some of the answers, some of the things that are there so we can get to the answers, we have to do some of these weird things. The C. elegans' is nerves mimic ours. Basically, it's a long strand that has projections projecting off of the head end and then some smaller projections branching off of the tail end. And what scientists have discovered is that those connectors, initially they don't connect. So here I've got the tail of one and the head of the other. And they come close, those projections come close. And when a message is going from one nerve cell to another, it jumps across that connector, that connecting space. We call it a synapse. Yeah, people, some people are, are saying that. We call it a synapse. Now, when I am doing certain things that stimulates my brain, who would have thought, stimulate the brain? We've got it, why do we have to stimulate it? When I'm doing certain things that stimulates the brain, the nerve cells grow like little small extensions from the extensions. And they eventually connect to other cells. So now the space I have to jump over is not so big. I narrow down the space of the synapse. Why is that an issue? I've been messing up with my diet a little bit. I really love that salt on my french fries and I gotta have my ketchup. So in the salt, there's this molecule called sodium. Well, sodium is necessary for the nerves to do what they do. If my sodium intake is too great or too little, I'm not eating any salt, not touching it can go either way, my nerve impulses are not correct. Any of you ever have twitching in different parts of the body? You feel your muscle twitching? Cramp? Charlie horse? Have you ever asked your doctor what you should do about it? Eat a banana! Potassium! Another element from our body that allows our nerves to do what they do. So, if I've got those extra extensions, I, I mean, yes, I do have to worry about my potassium and my sodium, but I don't have to worry as much because now the chances of a misfire, of the message getting distorted, is minimized. Mental illness, many times the doctors give you pills or liquids. Those pills or liquids make the synapse chemistry perfect for that message to jump across. And a lot of times what causes us to have these issues is because something's happening chemically at the synapse and the message gets distorted. You should be happy right now. I just gave you a million dollars. Oh, I gotta pay IRS. Okay, but you got the rest of the money. That thought process is not normal. Most people would be smiling. Now, where am I investing this sort of continue to grow? But some people will say, <laughs> so, and share with your children. <laughs> some people would, you know, like panic. The doctors say, that's a sign of depression. Well, why am I depressed? My synapse is not chemically balanced. So if I've got greater connections, the chances of my synapse interfering is not so great. But let's shift that back to the children. That's the focus of today. And many of them have issues that are not being diagnosed until it's too late, not too late, but until later. So please pay attention to the signs, including in our children. But anyway, so I'm an artist and I'm creating things. I'm not just duplicating, I'm not just playing this score or painting this particular thing by numbers. I'm actually creating. Every single time I start creating, my mind is thinking outside of the box. And every time I think outside of the box, I am extending my projections, my extensions. 
I'm problem solving. Oh, what am I wearing to school today? I don't have a choice, I gotta wear a uniform. But let me be in a culture where I don't have to wear that uniform and I have to choose. Okay, morally I can't wear this because you know uh, that's too short or not, you know, not appropriate. I can't wear that. I can't wear this because I wore it yesterday. I can't wear this because uh, it's not that, that time of the year. Those decisions that I have to make causes my brain to make extensions. Should I eat this or that? But what's in the refrigerator? What's in the store? What's on sale? I told my husband this morning and I'm embarrassed. I said, buy whatever's on sale. I should have said, no, let's look at the nutritional value and what have we had lately. I was in a hurry. So yes, I, yeah, we do that, okay? But do we do it every day? Is this the way we make choices every day? What's in front of me? That's what I will choose. We're not making those extra connections. And um, audience, it kind of slows down at the age of 25. So those of us who are a little over 25, just a little bit. It's not too late for us to make those connections, but it's just happening at a slower pace. When is it too late? The brain is, the, when it stops functioning, that's when they actually sign the signature to say that your body is no longer alive. So when is it too late? <clears throat> at death. So we can keep doing this. But if our children did this, if they had opportunities to choose, to be problem solvers, to think, to reason, they would be more productive as adults. But what do we do? Write the words 10 times. So how do I do the 10 times? If the word is apple, A-A-A-A-A-A-A, P-P-P-P-P-P-P. I don't do A-P-P-L-E, I go A-A-A. How's that teaching me how to spell? It's not. It's not. So in our schools, we're not providing the children with what they need in order for them to be able to think. That five letter word is powerful. Let's go back to our scripture. God said read. He didn't just tell us to read anything. He said read in his name. And he, what did he tell us to read? Not literally what's in front of you, but the symbolic of what's there. That symbolic reading, the signs, the ayats that we're reading, that represents what's physically there and the allegorical and the extension, that is help, helping us develop those connections. But it's not just the reading, because that's not all he said in that book. It didn't stop with read in, my, in, in the name of God. It didn't stop with that. There's 114 chapters of stuff there for us to do. I don't even know how many ayats all together. So, Imam Arthur Muhammad gave us these four sections that are supposed to be interacting. If we don't have these four functional things happening in our community, the community stops. It's not dynamic anymore. Notice number two? Notice that second one? Yeah. And we can't just be stuck there. It's only one part. We can't be so, and not look at everything. He also mentioned in the final battlefield this idea of the herd and rising above the herd. Teaching our children to exist in a status quo like environment is not the solution. So what are you gonna do? I'm going to go to school. I'm gonna get my eighth grade diploma and then I'm gonna get my high school diploma and I'm going to college and I'm going to corporate America. And I'm going to have that house with the picket fence, the two and a half kids, and the dog. I think it's changed. It's one and a half kids now. And the dog. So that the dog. I'm going to drive a sedan car, and I'm going to put some money away for my children, and I'm going to retire, and I'm going to live in a condominium, and that's life. And what did your parents do? They went to school and they and they and they and they did exactly what I'm gonna do and that's my only aspiration. That's all I have to look forward to. I got a so-and-so on the ACT. I got a perfect score on the SAT. I took the graduate record exam, I got into grad school, I took the LSAT, I got into law school, I took the MCAT. Alphabets. What about what those alphabets mean? 
Are we teaching the children what going to school really is about? It's not about you getting your nine to five. A career and a job are not always synonymous. Right. Who are you? Well, my name is, and I'm so-and-so's child. Who are you? What makes you tick? I want you to draw a picture, Jack, exactly like this. I want you to write exactly. I had a teacher, colleague of mine, saw time to solve a math problem. Red line, top of the paper, names up there. Underneath the name, red line. And then come down the middle of the sheet with a white line. I mean a red line, another red line, excuse me, on a white sheet of paper. And the problem was written on this side, and the answers were written on this side. And if you didn't do it that way, the teacher didn't accept your paper. Irregardless of what you put on the paper, the format was so rigid, excuse me, you seeing what I'm doing here? The format was so rigid that the children were stuck in a rut of having to do it a certain way. My daughter told me later, um, I should, I'll say this off of the live stream, like I'm not gonna do that publicly. Remind me, local people, I have something to share with you. I'm not gonna do it now. Okay, but we have to be careful to make sure, okay, yes, got 54 minutes. So we have to make sure, okay, we have to make sure that what we're giving our children, I'm using that five letter word again, allows them to think, including in how they present to us. Well, I only have one way of giving my test. It's convenient for me. But is it convenient for the child? Now, I'm, I'm hoping you all are taking in everything I'm saying. I'm not off the topic yet. I can go there though. So Allah created us to think, and that's what separates us from the C. elegants. That's what separates us from our dogs, our cats, our fish. That's what separates us from bacteria, is our ability to think. And doesn't he tell us how he gave us an understanding, the names of things, that even the jinn don't know? That even the jinn don't know. So we have a special talent, but we have to use it and teach our children how to use it. So in the final battlefield, Imam Walter D. Muhammad talked about a concept, evolution, and I'm about to change with this is ending this particular introduction. Evolution reflects change. And evolution is built into creation. <coughs> We see it, not us, us specifically, but Americans. There are those in America who see evolution as a dirty word. Oh no, it's against religion. But evolution is built into creation. And when you see the variety that's out there in creation, things that no longer exist, those that are now newer, when you see the variety, you see the beauty in God's creation because every single time DNA separates so that it can do its job. It's designed to stay together to keep its coat protected. But when it's time for the DNA to do its job, it splits apart and becomes two separate halves. And every single time it separates, it's vulnerable to mutations. And some of those mutations are natural mutations. And that's what gives us evolution. And some of those mutations are affected are caused by the environment, and that can also be natural, but some of them are man-made, we call that genetic engineering. And we messed up, I'm going back to the definition of life, just in case anybody's <coughs> thinking, oh yeah, man's good, man-made life. Um, Dolly couldn't reproduce. Are you hearing me? Dolly could not reproduce. The genetically one of the genetically engineered animals? She couldn't reproduce. So was she alive by the definition? No. So did man make life? No. I'm just putting it out there. <laughs> Something to think about. All right, another thing that Imam Walter D. Muhammad said in the final battlefield, again, $13, <coughs> the DM publication tape, <coughs> wonderful text. Text, notice I said text. Some of us might get it as an easy read. I'll just get something to read at night. No. No. 
there's a chance for you to grow in that book and every single thing that he represented and everything that God put here for us there's room for us to grow one of those characteristics of living organisms all right so he also said how we've got a lot of myths out here and how being educated, and I'm, I'm purposely not using that word there that, that starts with an S right now. I'll go back to that in a minute. But being educated to be able to think helps to dispel myths. And there's a little bit of truth in some of these things that people connect myths to because they need an answer and God gives them the answer, but they don't understand that answer, so they put a mythical explanation to it. But when you look at the myth itself, there's nothing there. But my attempt to try to explain in the absence of knowledge what God was trying to show me. So when we were younger, we went to a Muslim school and we thought this was a joke. But our neighbors like, are you crazy? You shouldn't be laughing at this. This is reality. So those big golf ball things that were falling from the sky, we called it hell. Our neighbors were like, no. A hair is scratching her scalp, and that's her dandruff. No, that's not dandruff. It's cold. It's melting in my hand. Cause hey, I was taught to do this: look at things, read things, not just believe something without any evidence of why I'm believing it. So, education comes to dispel the myths. Education comes to dispel the misunderstandings. Yeah, my uncle died from a, uh, somebody shot him. That's why I got RIP on my shirt and his face. And I got this, this uh, shrine for him at home so, he can, so I can always remember my uncle. And I'm gonna grow up and be just like my uncle. So if you cross me, I'm gonna come at you like my uncle came at you. And I'm gonna be fine. Because my uncle's looking down on me. He's up there. I know he ain't, you know. He's up there. He's a good guy. Oh, yeah, it's a badge of honor to go to prison. Because I stood up for whatever I had to stand up for. This is the misconception that our youth have on the streets. Or those who are in environments where education is not given to them as a solution. Showing them the correct way of doing things. Who says it's correct? I don't want to be part of that world. This is my culture. We run this. I don't want to be an Oreo. You want me to be like you? Who says you're the boss? You used to be the boss of my ancestors because you're not my boss. I'm my boss. Education helps to clear up those kinds of misunderstandings. Because truth be told, Okay, irregardless of who's living on Pennsylvania Avenue right now. But the doors of the world are wide open to anybody who chooses to walk through those doors. It's a choice to walk through those doors. I have a student recently. We were meeting in a um, function at work, at school. And he came up to me and he said he's a finalist for the National uh, Merit. Scholarship. He was, we both screamed in a quiet auditorium. Everybody is like, what's wrong? He's a finalist, a minority child of many that's a finalist for the National Merit Scholarship. He can go to multiple schools for free ride. A free ride. And it's not about the tuition of the school. And how did he get the ability to do that? Education. He took a test. That package that I was just holding up reflects study questions for the test. Some people, did any of you all recognize the book? Did anybody in the room, raise your hands, just ask. Anybody recognize the book that I was just holding up? One person, one per two. Educator, parent of two children who are in college right now, a person who has been involved with nursing and, and helping others for a long, long time. How about the rest of us? Any of you grandparents ever seen this book? 
Any of you parents ever seen this book? Oh, yes, I have. Okay. Another parent of college people. So, what am I saying? There are opportunities out there that we're not taking advantage of. And as a community, in order for us to be dynamic, we have to have all of the pieces in place. And we need to be working. And we need to be energized. I'm reminding them, summing things up before I go to the next part. Of the key concepts I want you to walk away with as I ship gears. We need to be working. We need to use the resources that we've been given to energize ourselves so that we can do the things that we need to do. So we can have this dynamic community, so we can rise above the herd, provide our children with the resources so they can rise above the herd. And education is how we get them there. Now that word that starts with an S. So, America's wonderful. Land of opportunity. Freedoms that a lot of places don't have. And that freedom goes both ways. I can be free to do right, and I can be free to do wrong. And I can be free to go back and forth. So America comes up with this wonderful idea. No child will be left behind. OK, it wasn't their idea to start with. Education was critical in the days of Prophet Muhammad. He even granted people freedoms because of education. Okay, I'm just putting it out there. Even though, even at that time, women were not being educated. Oh, no, no, no. He was inspired to tell us, gentlemen, husbands, fathers, you can increase your chances to get to the gym if you have educated the females in your family. I'm just saying how important it was. Going back 1,400 years ago. Oh, we got this idea. No child left behind. We got this. We're going to make this work. While we're like in the bottom of the top one-third industrialized nations, we're in the bottom of the top one-third. We're not even close to the top. And we're going to wake up one day, oh, we should educate all of our children. Kind of late. Kind of late. But, okay, we got that. We're going to educate everybody. And you know what we're going to do to make sure everybody's educated? We're going to give this common core curriculum. Everybody needs to have this basic foundation. They didn't say everybody needs to have this kind of, these concepts. They said this is the basic, this is the core. That doesn't mean we stop there. But America, whoa. Some of us, not all of us, some of us have this misnomer. I'm just going to do the basics. I work eight hours. That's seven hours, 59 minutes, and 59 and a half seconds, because it takes me half a second to punch out. That's how long I'm going to work. Not one second over. So we just do enough to get by. Oh, Muslims don't do that. Oh, no, no, no. Our book tells us excellence all the way. You don't do anything unless you seek to perfect it. But America doesn't have that understanding. So, <coughs> common core curriculum. Oh, by the way, states, we're not going to give you any money unless you design your own test. And you give that test. You, you, can choose, you can choose what the test is. And you give that test and your children and your state have to pass that test. Or we don't give you the federal money that the taxpayers give. Okay, that we take from the taxpayers. I'm sorry. <laughs> that we take from the taxpayers to cover education. And so Illinois chose to use this test called the PARC exam. Don't ask me what that alphabet soup stands for. I'm sorry. I don't know. But I've seen the questions. And that whole thing of T-H-I-N-K is embedded everywhere in that test. But we're not teaching the children to do that five-letter activity. Why? Because I said so. Stop asking why. You're being insubordinate. What? Why? Don't ask me why. I'm the authority in the classroom. You do what I tell you to do. And so we're creating these non-thinkers. Then we give them this test. And you know what my particular school district is doing? We're fighting the test. We think it's wrong to say that you're going to hold my professional rating and my job security to the children passing this test. I just said to you, the test is full of thinking. And we don't want that test given. I'll be like, yes. 
because it gives the children the foundation. I got proof because they're going to pass this test that they can think because I know that's what they need to survive. And the Common Core curriculum includes how many subjects? Art, eh. math, eh. social studies. Oh no! Wait, 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 wait! Isn't social studies what teaches you how to function in a culture? This is the same culture where people are dying because of battles they're fighting on the streets. And social studies teaches me how I can use the law to protect myself, how I have certain rights, and I can use this structure that's, hey, this thing called the Constitution. I can use this to protect myself instead of a gun or a knife or drugs because it also deals with psychology and how to even function within yourself. But that's not on the park. Oh, no. And that, that one right there, that S word, no, it's not on there either. It's not there. So what do I do? I'm in an at-risk school. Um, teachers, your job is contingent upon the children passing the test. Guess what I'm teaching? <laughs> Math and reading. Or language arts. That's what I'm teaching. Science, when I can. I'll get to it. Social studies, when I can. Uh, not even college, because when they get to high school, they start flunking out. Because in high school, we don't do the park. In high school, I give a biology test. I give a, we give chemistry tests. We give physics tests. We don't give the park exam. The park exam is for the elementary school children. And on the flip side of that, I happen to be a science department chairperson and we're bringing in two new classes to give a special diploma to our <coughs> graduates. Advanced placement is a program that's been put in place by this organization called the College Board. College Board basically writes the ACT exam, college entrance exam. And the AP classes that we're gonna be promoting, one is a seminar class on how to write research papers, five, that word over there, science, and one is a class on doing research before you graduate. And you need the science. Now if you walk in there and you came from an elementary school that didn't have science as part of their, okay, you can say it's there, but are you really teaching it? But they don't actually teach science and you walking into our school, there's no chance in Hades that you're gonna have a chance to take those two classes. None, none, none. The elites will get it. And where do the elite go to school? They go to school in places where the park exam exists, but they make sure they're teaching the children. Not just what they need for that, but for functioning outside of that test. Because guess what? The parents are saying, excuse me, principal, you're gonna do what? The grandparents are, one parent actually came in, I wanna see your course description. It wasn't even his child. It was a grandchild of his that could be coming to our school. I want you to email me your course description. He wants to make sure as a grandfather that the school is giving his child what they need. Are you hearing me? This is our future. This is our future. Before I was a parent, I was an aunt. Before I was a parent, I was a cousin. I was a sibling of younger s brothers and sisters. Education for, for me didn't start when I became a parent as far as making sure the children had what they needed. And I'm saying to those of us who can hear my voice right now, we have a responsibility of saving our children. Enough, I think you got the point. So how do we save them? Knowledge, giving them the right education, not just any education, the right education. Imam Anthony mentioned the University of Michigan. He and I have had an extensive conversation about this school. I love it as a school. I've been in a school of engineering several times. I've told children about their school of engineering. I think it's wonderful. There's one little caveat, and I hope that my friend there is not listening to this conversation. 
They have dollars that are coming to them from places that need new blood. And that's normal. That's what people do. You want longevity? You invest. You make the sacrifice, you invest. The little small problem I have with them is that when the children come up with these wonderful, innovative ideas, the people who supply the money own the patents. The children can put it on their resume that they came up with this wonderful idea for the companies. I'm not gonna name them. I want to, but I'm not. But the children don't own the patents. It's owned by the person who's put up the money making sure that our children are set is important. Yes, we want them to go to schools that will provide them with quality education, but we want their future to be more than just for the first four years of that adulthood life. So how do we do that? Knowledge is power. So what kind of knowledge should we get? Now, I'm gonna go through this very quickly. This is a part of a presentation that I made two weeks ago for a, a school system that's part of the Sister Clara Muhammad school system. So let me fast forward. This is about Sister Clara Muhammad. I'm not gonna have you read it. It's available. Most of us probably know this already. The Sister Clara Muhammad school system is unique. It's a private school system that has a curriculum aligned with our understanding of our role. Now there's some issues. You got issues everywhere. But if you push the issues aside, that education, there's nothing to compare to it. Let me give you a tiny bit on that. You're right. You're right. I was teaching for a university in the, the Chicago High Park neighborhood, for those of you that know. The university, the class I was teaching was um, a class that dealt with social justice, buzzword for today's culture. As I was doing my research for that program, for that course that I was teaching, I'm reading to see who has provided like a definition or some examples or done research on social justice under that actual umbrella. One of the documents that I read, 5335 South Greenwood. As the first are you listening to me? Yes. The first elementary high school to incorporate social justice into its curriculum. For those of you that don't, don't, don't know your history, that's the University of Islam in Chicago, Temple Number Two. The second Muslim school opened under the spouse of Sister Clara Muhammad. And she was part of that school being opened. And she's the one who said about her young children, I'll be as dead as this doornail before I let you take them. And I can just see this little small statue woman standing there with this close to seven foot tall truant officer in her face saying, you're not taking my children and educating them. So what does she do? She set up a program with other pioneers that provided an education for her children. And it was more than just the 10 that she gave birth to. And alhamdulillah, my husband and I, and, and several of you in this room, you were students there. Mother was a um, teacher and an administrator. So we've got, and, and mother did things on um, Saturdays and Tuesdays, and then she also contributed and made sure her children were educated there. So the system represents an effort that the world recognizes. Because not only did I read that one study that was giving credit to 5335, and the last name on there was not Muhammad Ali Shabazz or anything else that reflect, or uh, somebody X. This was not someone who was benefiting from giving credit to this history directly but they were being truthful. A scientist overseas in England 
doing a piece on how religion helps to serve social justice needs. Cited the University of Islam and the work of Elijah Muhammad and Imam Walter Dean Muhammad as being an example of social justice being used in a community effort. Because everybody's like, well, how do I put that in the curriculum? I gotta teach Common Core. I gotta teach the Clark exam. I gotta do this, I gotta do that. We don't have time to teach them how to be normal human beings. Teach them about humanity. I don't have time for that. Where well, here were some examples. It started right amongst us. How do we lose our position of being the forerunners? We're not taking seriously what we think. The blessings, which are the favors of your Lord? Lord would you deny? Will you deny? We have a history here. And I'm not saying that I'm going to put on a white uniform and start doing the vanguard thing all over again. I'm not going to do, you know, going backwards. I'm taking it and going forward. Mother of one of my classmates I graduated with, I'm sorry, this disease, I didn't see you earlier. So we move forward, but we don't forget the good. Imam Walter B. Muhammad said once, you don't throw the baby out of the wash water. You take the good. We have an exemplary school system. We're not using it. We have it. We're not, well, 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 okay, wait, well, now this is Chicago, and we're not in Atlanta, and we're not in uh, oh, New York, Queens, I'm sorry, I'm thinking New Jersey. We've got a few. We used to have 47. 47. That's not quite every state, but it's a good number. So what do we do? And we don't have enough children in Chicago uh, if we really looked at it, we could start with one child. We could start with two. We don't have to have, the, in my graduating class, there were 13 girls. And then there were 13 boys. We went to school at a different time. On graduation day, we saw everybody. We didn't have to have a big program to have a good school. But we don't have the resources. I'm busy. And I, you're busy? Which hand do you want that book in? <laughs> You're busy doing what? We have a responsibility on us. We have a responsibility until we make the sacrifice. A stable in Chicago, an old stable is where we had our classes. Not, not by the time I got there, it was a physical school. But when it started, it was a stable. How much education do you have? Maybe an eighth grade diploma. But the quality education that they gave us was nothing could touch it. So, Sister Clara Muhammad, pioneers such as her, they started the Sister Clara Muhammad schools with basically nothing. One brother walked the streets of Chicago with a cart selling rags rags to make money to donate for that school to exist. What am I saying to us? Where are our priorities? Don't you dare complain about that child who broke the window of your car. If you haven't been doing anything to get that child educated because that's the key. Don't you dare complain if you're not doing what you can to make sure that they have an education. So what can you do? I'm going to sell a particular program right now. This is one example, but it's doable today. Mm -hmm. And what did I do? My youngest is a grad student in college. I don't need an elementary school for my children or for my uh, a high school for them. But I have grandchildren. I have grandchildren. My granddaughter is enrolled in this school. She's enrolled in this school, and her grandmother is paying for it. Until my daughter sees the value of it, and she's being very frugal with her money. Somebody taught her that. I don't know who. <laughs> I have another daughter that's an accountant. I think she taught her. But, because I'm, I'm spending my money. I'm sorry. I think this is worthwhile investment. So the New Medina School is established online. Not only is the computer good for YouTube videos, 
I'm going to talk about that in a second. We've got some powerful tools out there. We just have to embrace them correctly and use them. But the computer is also able to give our children an Islamic education even if it's only one child. Now how do I do that? I'm not the teacher. I don't have a teaching education. I'm not, I don't know how to do this. Neither does Sister Clara Muhammad. But wait a minute now, things have changed. Because actually in my school, I'm teaching this device called the Arduino. Anybody know what an Arduino is? Raspberry Pi. Somebody, I was in another meeting and I said that somebody said it's uh, something sweet with some fruit. <laughs> it's a handheld microprocessor computer. And I'm teaching young children how to use this to design ways to control things. Turn the lights on and off, start your car. One child is actually, I don't think I'll be violating her, her um, ability to get a patent because I'm not gonna tell you how she's doing it. She's taking a bike and she's designing something so she can put on that bike so if a person who's partially paralyzed is riding the bike and they are off balance and they can't quickly react by turning the handlebars, the bike will turn the handlebars for them. And she's using the Arduino to do that. What grade level? What grade level? When she started, she was an eighth grader. And now she's a senior and she's almost perfected it. This is the patent kind of stuff that our children can be doing. So that's what we're doing. Oh, whoa, how's Numadina going to keep up with that? We've got people with backgrounds, with know-how, and you represent people with backgrounds and know-how. Because the curriculum can be typed online, sent to the, the school sport, and then they can develop the lessons based off of your talents and your skills. Are you hearing me? What is my job? I have a person who does blah, blah, blah. I'm going to pick on David for a minute. David is in construction. David builds things. He repairs things. David has math concepts that allows him to do the math required to do the drawings. David has business sense, so there's an economic piece to his math skills. And David knows what materials go where and how and how to choose this and choose that. David could present some key concepts, business development, business sustainability, the drawings themselves. I have a student right now trying to figure out how to use a computer assistant drawing program. I don't want to put them on a computer to do the program because I want them to first of all understand drawings. What the heck is 2D versus 3D? David's skills with doing blueprints and whatnot can help me teach that child. What does David have to do? David types up some of the key concepts that's involved in doing drawings. And he sends them to me. I make the lessons. I'm the one with the educational background. But I don't have the background in drafting, for example. I have another talent. I have another skill. You take your talent, you put down the key concepts, you send it to us, we make the lesson. Now you're involved in writing the curriculum. And you've got that Islamic background. Don't just use it to sit and do some bean soup sciencing. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm I did go there. Okay, we, I think we science on more than bean soup now. But don't just sit there and just talk about what was the cup of? It was bad. What did they talk about? It was, it was good. Yeah. I'm waiting for what it was spoken about. How do we take that? My husband and I were having a conversation. I said, where's the product? From the two hours you were sitting there, not my, not my husband, I'm not picking on him, no, this is not for him, this is <laughs> conversation we were having. But for the two hours that we're sitting somewhere, what product do we have for our two hours? What do we walk away with and what do we do with that? What's tangible that we can walk away with and say, this was worth my time? Because hey, you don't have time. So what are you doing with the time you have? And where's the product from that? So the New Medina school system is set up in such a way where you can either, and the Mosque Cares is taking full advantage of this very shortly. You'll be hearing some announcements, inshallah, very soon. You can either start your own full running school using this particular curriculum as a replacement for the textbooks. 
as a way to compensate for the fact that you don't have teachers for every single subject for every single grade. Because when I was in, at the University of Islam, there was at least one year I can remember where two grades were in one room. And we had to, huh? And we had to, the teacher had to split themselves up between one grade and another at given moments. It's still going. I st and I'm doing it right now in my class. I got a senior class and a group of eighth graders all at the same time. And I'm in a CPA, a Chicago public school. So this curriculum allows you to address one group while you focus in on the other and then you switch places. And it's done virtually. Well, we can't afford computers. It's some called the Chicago Public Library. Mm -hmm. Children can go to the library and do some of this work because those computers are free. And they're refurbished computers. The computers that I'm using for the students that I'm working with, not with my job, but outside of my job, I have a, a, a club. And it was mentioned earlier that we were here yesterday as part of the first Sunday weekend um, offering science experiences for the children. The computers that I'm using, Imam Elam helped me get. Discounts that he has access to. They're refurbished. Children don't care. They just want to be able to access what they need to access. It's not pretty. It doesn't have an Apple symbol. Oh, I'm sorry, Apple. It doesn't have a symbol on it. They don't care. It's not a snap together this and that. These children don't. They just want to learn. So the New Medina schools can either be the full-fledged school or you got a school running and you just want to enhance something, or you want to start a school. You don't have a school, and you don't have enough students and enough interest in parents. You have one, you can start the program. And that's what I'm doing with my program, Making a Difference Through Discoveries. I have four students, I started out with three. Now I have four, and inshallah, I'll be picking up some more that are enrolled in New Medina School while they're doing their science. So there's a way to do this where our children can still get the quality education and you can become a part, either as a parent that's enrolling a child, a teacher who's helping us teach by reading things and you're doing it all virtually so you don't have to physically move anywhere, or you can help us write the curriculum. And it's necessary. I'm working on the final battlefield curriculum right now. Straight from Imam Wa'at the Dean Muhammad. Straight from his understanding of Prophet Muhammad's example. Straight from his understanding of the Quran and his teaching us to understand. So what am I saying? We don't have to let our children be victimized. And Islam, if Islam tells us to read the signs, it's telling us to T-H-I-N-K. Your actions are judged by your intentions. You can't have intentions and be, you know, not, not there mentally. You have to be thinking to have an intention. When you go into that fast every Ramadan morning, you start off with your niya. You don't just con unconsciously, I'm not eating. Why am I not eating? To please my creator. Because this is what he asked me to do. Not for him, for me. That's a thought process. It's built into our dean. So who's the perfect person to write a quality thinking education? The same people that started that whole social justice thing. And what is social justice in a nutshell? It's a way to empower you so that you can exact justice for yourself. Are you hearing me? I'm not gonna wait for my politician to put it in place. Oh, I'm not going to the polls anyway. Who cares? But when they do get elected in, I didn't go for them. I'm yelling and screaming because they're not doing a good job. I didn't give them my platform. I didn't vote for them. I didn't help the person who is representing my platform win. And then I'm going to sit back and start complaining. That's not social justice. That's social ineptness. And that's what we've been a victim of for years, generations. So we had an answer for it. And it's still embedded within the network of our community. Most of you probably heard the concept DNA. The DNA that's in a species moves from generation to generation to generation. 
And what is the DNA? Oh, you ask the average person what DNA does. Oh, yeah, it just tells us who we are. It just decides if I'm going to have brown hair, black hair, green hair. That's before my beautician gets to my head. <laughs> That's all it's really doing. Don't tell me what my height's going to be. Do I have the propensity to gain weight real quickly or not before I start taking my diet pills? So that's my DNA does. That's not actually what it does. That's the layman's version of it. Your DNA decides what proteins are going to be made and when. It takes the raw materials called amino acids that's in your body that comes a lot of times from what you eat. It takes those amino acids and it tells the amino acids, you're going to bond here. And next to you is going to be this one. And then two or three of those. And eventually you're going to all get twisted and coiled and turned into a bundle. And that protein is going to say, hey, metabolism, you're going to run real slow. Now, this particular protein is going to say, metabolism, you're going to run real fast. So this person's going to gain weight pretty regularly, and this person's not going to be gaining weight too regularly. They both sit there eating the same stuff, doing the same exercise. But because I got this protein, and you don't, you're going to pick up weight. So it's the production of these proteins that the DNA are there for. And as I because I'm alive and viable, I'm reproducing, I'm putting forth offspring, I'm passing that genetic pattern on from offspring to offspring <laughs> to offspring. Now, here comes a child. Child comes into a community. Community established on certain principles. The principles that the community established upon are the community's DNA. They're the things that determine what the community is going to do. And the DNA should transfer from generation to generation to generation. So what we had pre-slavery, because guess what? We were created by a creator. We didn't start to exist with slavery. What we had pre-slavery, what allowed us to survive during slavery, after slavery, we went through Jim Crow. We went through depression. Jim Crow and, and this industrialization stuff that happened even before that. We went through all of that. And then we got emancipated along the way. Then the civil rights era came in and there were some laws put in place that said Jim Crow can't happen. And then we got to this point of equal opportunity, equal pay. <gasps> A Hawaiian in the White House. We don't say he's black. Some of us, we don't know. He's not black enough. A Hawaiian and a white, he's still American. Right. And he still has African American ancestry. I'm sorry, people. Right. That's right. What now is the reason our children can't survive? We went through all of this. Does anybody know how one of the most precious gems in the world is made? A diamond. Yeah. Precious. 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 Extreme. Right. Extreme pressure. We been through it genetically. Our children have the DNA of a culture that's been through extreme pressure. Our children are diamonds. Are you hearing me? Yes. And no one's keeping them back. Us, my parents, my grandparents, neighbors, relatives, friends, and family. Because any other culture would see that diamond and the heart And we're scared of our kids. We're afraid of them. We let them do stuff around us. We don't stop them. We let them be, oh, somebody else will get them. That one's destined for prison. That one's not gonna survive. And we let them just go. We've got some solutions. We have some solutions. Let's say this again, how can you help? I'm speeding this up. If you want to know more about all of this, we've got this. That's the curriculum. I'm sorry. We've got all these classes. This is high school, and that's the AP offerings are there. Um, we've got um, Islamic studies is becoming more and more prevalent with uh, people who are helping us with writing the curriculum. That's why we need more of those of you that have been studying Imam's words that can hear my voice. We need you. We need you. Your kutbah can become a lesson. All you have to do is give it to us in digital form. That's the easiest way for it to happen and the quickest. Your Arabic class can become a lesson.
that's virtually available. Now, if you need money for this, we're not going to, I'm not going to, this is real. We can talk, but we're not looking for people that's trying to sell. We're looking at people, I'm, I'm not saying that you shouldn't be trying to sell. I'm not saying that. If that's what you got to do, you got to do it. My mortgage company would be really happy if I was getting paid for all of this. No, no, maybe they wouldn't because I'd be paying my mortgage off faster. Less interest for them. But sometimes it's about the sacrifice. Now, Imam Anthony was talking about the experience in Lansing and Alhamdulillah. My husband and I was able to experience that. Thank you. Alhamdulillah. And I was one of the ones who got there really late. I was supposed to be there a little earlier. We were celebrating our honeymoon. Oh, not honeymoon. It was a honeymoon. But it was our anniversary. And uh, we got caught up in the colors of Michigan. I'm sorry. It was just nature talking to us. Um, but uh, uh, I forget now when I brought it up. Oh, after we left Lansing, we left the Islamic Center where they invited us to help to celebrate with the Eid. We left there. We drove to Battle Creek. Anybody been to Battle Creek? Okay, a few people. There's a monument in Battle Creek. Sir Journal Truth. I was just going because I just had never been to Battle Creek. I wanted to see Tony Tiger. When I heard that, I'm like, I'm not going to bypass this place. And my husband and I were both in tears, and I'm not going to tell you why. You need to go there yourself. We go to Washington, we see Lincoln's Monument, we see go to Battle Creek. And then go to Washington too because Martin Luther King has a monument. And I'm not saying this because they're black. I'm saying this because of what they stood for. Mm -hmm. What they stood for. Go see what she had to say and what she did. Maybe it'll spark some fire in some of us. All right, this is an example of what a lesson looks like. It's, this is not the lesson itself, but the purple part. That's an example of what a lesson, what the curriculum looks like. It's not the full lesson, and I can get this for you if you want to see more. We actually have a website. I have some um, cards up here re representing um, the school itself. And one of the things that uh, we have available is information on where you can email us, you can call us, and then you can go to our website and see a little bit more about what classes and all of that that we have to offer. But if um, if if uh, you want, I'll hang around a little a lo good while after this meeting. If anybody wants to talk to me directly, so um, this is an example. They see a screen. They see some things color coded to match their grade level. The young children need a lot more stimulation. They need things to be isolated. Maybe some larger print. This is an audio lesson. I'm not going to turn it on right now, but if the child clicks on the arrow it actually, and it gets, has the earphones thing, they can actually hear the pronunciation of the alphabets as they're being said. So it's at different levels. It starts K, goes all the way up to, uh, to, to uh, 12th grade, including the AP classes. Um, here's an example of a physics lesson that includes, uh, this is gas pressure, gas laws. And so they've got the graphics mixed in. Some of these are lessons in midstream, so there's an introductory piece, then there's the lessons where it teaches them some stuff, and then there's the assessment at the end. There's a lot of review. If you get something wrong, it's okay. It sends you back to another place. Not to redo the same thing all over again, but to send you back to something that will help you learn the stuff that you might not have gotten in the first place. If you can actually do more, then what's in this lesson? It can bypass some of this and take you to where you can actually be learning something. It doesn't make sense to just keep you at the same pace. Now here's where the modifications parts come in. These two images here reflects new lessons that were made where we're actually using the story of, of uh, Prophet Musa and his brother Aaron, Harun. We're actually using the concepts of their life and the challenges and things that they were forced with and we've made new lessons to go along with the lessons that we already have in place. And so this is an example of the modifications that we're doing ourselves and we're also asking for those who have the ability to give us things that you're an expert in, give us that information and we'll make the lessons out of them. So I actually took a sister's book, Sister Renee um, Muhammad Abdullah, I took one of her books, I'm not going to show it to you right now. She wrote a book, a children's book, and it was a story about a family dealing with a father not being present. So I took her book. And I actually wrote questions from her book to turn it into a lesson for younger children. So here's an example of an artist in our community 
whose works are able to be used to help others learn. I'm not gonna I'm gonna show it to her before I publish it, but uh, it's this is an example of how you can contribute to making this curriculum. The final battlefield questions. This is so tiny, you're not gonna be able to see, but again, I can make this uh, PowerPoint available to whomever. Uh, but here's an example of a passage where I summarize a portion of chapter one. I talked about battlefields and how on a battlefield you have a field that was there before the battle started where there was a community. There are the these and the those and the these, all these things working collectively together. And now there's a battle. And what does that battle represent? Well, if there's a battle that's happening internally, nothing's added to the community. Something's wrong with this one. Interact I'm not talking about those interactions. This one's not interacting with this one for whatever reason. And now you've got a conflict going on. And that conflict is going to disturb the order of whatever's going on there. And Imam Walter D. Muhammad connected life as a battlefield. Now listen to this. He show, is showing us how there are internal and external things happening that's causing conflict. And if we don't deal with those conflicts correctly, it deteriorates our social interactions, our political interactions, and all those other things that make that community dynamic. This was an email. Are you hearing me? There are philosophers that have gone down in history for bringing this kind of insight from a very negative perspective, filled with a whole lot of myths. Mm -hmm. Inspired by God. Listening, learning, using examples by another that was inspired by God that brought us scripture. And you, we, are his students. What am I saying to the students? You have in your heads, you have in your libraries, you have the ability to get more in your libraries by going to the publications. And because you've been sitting under this man all these years, your way of thinking is not normal. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. That is a very good thing. Okay? And that abnormal way of looking at things can help the world, just like that social justice premise did, answer some questions. Or we could just continue to battle. Or we could just continue to battle with things that are not going to allow us to go anywhere. And if you don't heed the signs that God has given us, and you are denying his favors, what did he promise us was going to happen? So here, I'm going to leave this. I'm going to end with this screen up so you can see the bold print in the middle reflects some questions that were written from the final battlefield. And then there's a few more, so I'm going to end. So after this is over, inshallah, you'll be able to look at it. And anybody who wants the complete file, um, just the file that I'm presenting today, it's available. I'm going to make it available through the Mosque Cares, if it's okay. And, um, and so you can, you can see it. But I'm, I want to end with this. We're a community. We are a community. And that's one of the reasons why the good part of what was there with the Nation of Islam existed because it was a community. I knew I was going to go to get my shopping bag, my clothes, my food. I knew where I was going to go to work because there were so many things happening in the community that I knew I had a job. I had plans to, in I actually invested in our bank at the time we had it. I was so proud when I first got my bank book. This is our bank. This is our financial institution. So we have a template, a DNA structure that's in place. Are we going to let it become mutated? Are we going to let it be cancer? Or are we going to keep its integrity in place and allow it to put forth viable offspring? We have your products. And I'm not pushing this because I happen to work with Amaz Cares. I was sitting there when this name came out. I was in the meeting. And I know the dialogue that went behind that name. 
I'm not saying this just because I'm a part of the mosque here. I'm saying this because my DNA connects to this. My DNA connects to this. Bring your businesses, products online. I don't mean that fit literally, like on the internet. <laughs> Bring it so that we can represent the best that our dean tells us to represent. Learn what you might have missed when the man was alive. Refresh your memory with what you learned when he was alive. So that you can become a productive component of this dynamic community. We have answers. What's the name of the of the uh, basketball, ladies basketball team in Atlantis, Muhammad Schools. Okay, what's the name of the Chicago? What's the name of what's the name of the Chicago basketball team that plays downtown that a certain person is on that they're hoping doesn't get hit? I mean, injured. What's the name of that team? Oh, you know, no, he's already injured. Oh my goodness. I didn't even ask you. The, the, I didn't even give you the next name or anything. But you know the name of the team. It's the Bulls. What is the name of the Muslim basketball team out of Atlanta? Lady Cavalry. Lady Khalifas. Lady Khalifas. But did we know that? Have any of us been to a game? Have we watched it? Or are we so busy doing other stuff? So we have a history. We have a legacy that we can give to our children. Let's give it to them. One more thing, my time is ending. It's actually up on the live stream, but Islamic education doesn't stop with high school. We have a Muslim college in Chicago with three, two members of our community teaching there. Two Muslim educators teaching there from our community. Now, there's a lot of other people there too. And I'm not taking anything away from them. But we have a voice of Imam Warabadi Muhammad in an Islamic college. Unfortunately, this is not online. Those people who are looking for some college classes to take just because you want to audit the classes, you want to actually get some credit, here's the information. Now, one more thing, and then I'm going to end. Actually, the, the, the theme is off, so I can tell you what I was going to tell you with the other thing. No, 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 no. Not yet? Okay. Okay, okay, I'll be nice. <laughs> I'll be nice. <laughs> I'll be nice. <laughs> I'll be nice. I'll be nice. <laughs> okay, so two years in a row we've tried this, and I'm hoping that people who are outside of Chicago are hearing me as well as those here. Two years in a row we've tried this with, this, with our uh, Muslim convention, annual Muslim convention. We've tried to honor an Islamic school so that we can show the positiveness that's going on across this country with our schools and give our students credit for doing a wonderful job and our professionals credit for helping these children out. So on the back of the card for New Medina is just what we had used to advertise uh, two years ago in 2013. We're planning to do the same thing. So if you can hear my voice and you are part of an Islamic school system, please get in touch with the Moschairs so that we can give credit to your school system and highlight you all for this year's uh, 2015's convention. So please uh, uh, oblige. Are there any questions before I close? Are there any questions? Yes, sir. Well, I question. Your presentation, Yes. Yes, and it's, 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 it's run by uh, two dynamic educators. Um, they understand the importance of Malik Al Shabazz and they're helping to instill that in the minds of the young people. They're not just this one person's legacy but in others too. So I think it's a wonderful thing. And then they aren't they aren't saying, oh these children can't be educated. They're meeting the children where they are and they're taking them up higher. And I think that's a beautiful thing. I think they should definitely be committed to that. I'm doing a lot. Yes ma'am. Well this live stream yes well, this live stream is available um, as a link. People can will be able to see it. We're actually gonna put a copy of it inshallah on the Mosque website. I'm talking about your presentation. Oh I am um, 
I, I've already been doing this a little bit, but it's going to be on the Moscare's website. I'm, it's going to be on New Medina's website. And then um, I have traveled, and I did give a little bit in Lansing, but it was short. It was a, it was a short time span that I had to work with this. I didn't give as much, but I am willing. Um, my husband and I, we, 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 we know how to eat and stretch food, so we save a little here and there. Our car is falling apart, but we're making it work. So we go long distances and short distances. Huh? Buy what's on sale. Uh, uh, yeah, we buy what's on sale. But we also try to make wise choices even with that. So yes. But any other questions? Thank you. Yes. Yes, sir. And I wasn't picking on you earlier. I'm sorry. Okay. I want to say that I didn't know that you were so appreciative. That is the best feeling that I have ever had served in recent times. Yes, sir. I, I think what she's asking, what a lot of the presenters are asked here, often after the program, uh, the Moscow doesn't have the capacity to distribute all of the lectures. Right. So we ask that you take some of the burden off of the presenter by giving them like, like $10 for the team. So uh, I don't know if Dr. Lynn has do that, but we have people that can help her. And if you just be patient, uh, keep the ten dollars and put it aside. We may be able to put you a copy uh, from you, ma'am. Uh, okay, put your copy. All right, come to the line. Yes. Thank you. Uh, okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, so. Our classes, we can do video classes. We can do, the, I showed you the still shots of a screen. Uh, we can do the audio. So the programs that we're using to develop these classes allows us to do all of that. And so a lot of what I do with my club, making a difference through discoveries, my husband videotapes me and we're trying to find the right way. We've got a way to get it online, but we're trying to find a way where it does it. It's not so, it's not so hard for it to start, I mean, it's, it's dragging. And so I'm thinking about a YouTube channel to set up my own private YouTube channel, and then I'll be able to use that link to embed that link within. And so that's where YouTube is very helpful with that. I've just I've been playing around with different things. I actually have one of my students at work. His assignment is to help me get my website, you know, where it's got more stuff available to it. So, um, so yeah, there's a way to do the audio, the uh, visual, the video. So yeah, yes, definitely. So even like with uh, uh, email my jeans classes to just have just his voice saying the alphabet to have Imam Darnell Kareem's recitation of the Quran and then to have right behind that a way for the child to repeat it and the computer to say that it's accurate or not we there's even a way to do that and I'm, I'm working with the programs that I'm using for the curriculum development to try to make it so that um, that interaction is there and then also, for those of you that are looking financially, and then it's not that I'm not, again, I don't want to keep my mortgage company happy. I want them to be really ticked off at me. I want to pay this thing off quickly. But uh, for those of you that this is your, your livelihood, and you, know, and you need to have this in order to put food in your mouth, we're not saying to just give, give, give. That's not, a, that's not Islamic. Prophet Muhammad was a businessman. He was a, um, uh, he and his wife, they traveled and they sold merchandise. He was a businessman. So he wasn't the kind of person who just lived like a pauper. This man, you know, he was a he was a full functioning human being. And money is real, economics is real. We can set it up so that your classes can be in addition to the regular curriculum. We can set it up as as a, 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 a what we call extracurricular class, a, um, where you get paid through PayPal and and you know, we would ask for something for the school um, because we would make the students available to you, but you could get paid separately um, through the program. So there's multiple ways that this can be done. And we're not saying that there's one way that fits all. That's what the old school system has said. And we're recognizing that we're all different. And we all have, you know, a garden is made up of a variety of problems, a variety of living organisms. Yes, sir. Uh, Brother Warren mentioned this to me a few time ago, but I didn't jump out there because I didn't have anything to leave you, but I want you to have my, my 
support and involvement one thousand percent. Even if you hadn't said that, you were already on board because I've already been talking to the believers of New Medina I about you. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to jump out there and say, "Oh, we're going to where we going?" I don't know. But so, believe yes. me, one thousand percent. Yes, sir. And yes, Allah sir. has blessed me so that I'm one of those that's not looking for you to come. Alhamdulillah. And, and, and to be honest with you, with making a difference through discoveries, it started off with one, one tuition amount, and then I noticed that things were happening where I didn't have to charge that much, so we went down a little bit. And just as I made the decision to do that, a little bit more started happening. So we're not at the point of being free, but we're not charging what we used to charge to make it work. Allah has been blessing us with, with, with access to resources. So. It's, it's so, if you give, Allah knows what you're doing and He responds. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Skype, it takes, it's slow. It's not, it's not um, as quick to respond. We found WebEx to be better. Yes. Um, um, this live stream is an option, but live stream is one directional. If I'm not mistaken, the WebEx allows both ways. So, and you can see the screen. You can see each other's faces. Um, you can respond via email. You can talk through the phone. There are multiple ways. So we've been toying around with different internet-based programs, but we're trying before we launch any of those classes, we want to make sure that there's a, a smooth flow. So that's what we're, we're I'm troubleshooting actually a lot of what you've seen me or that you'll see in this PowerPoint um, reflects stuff that I've done in my classes where I have 500, 300 or something students, close to 500 depending on the year. Um, and so I'm testing things out with them, which is a larger audience than most of us will see in a Claire Muhammad school at any given moment. So we're making sure that the programs that we're using have the capacity for that many students to be online working with it at the same time. Yes, Any other questions? Alhamdulillah, and I pray Allah that something that I said was helpful and uh, beneficial for you specifically, but for the children at, at, at large. Um, I'm praying to Allah that this will help save more of our children. And it's not about saving, don't, please don't get me wrong, when I say save our children, I'm not talking about their lives because Allah determines life, the beginning and the end. So that's not what I'm talking about, but the quality of life that they have. We have some control over it as their parents, their grandparents, their neighbors, their distant relatives. We have control over that. And if we mess with them or ignore them, I just don't want to be near you when the light will <laughs> Because you're messing with one of God's creatures. And that's not, and they're innocent. They're innocent. And if anything, we need to be protecting them and helping them. And it's not that difficult to do. Assalamu alaikum.